Good morning, and welcome to the Council on Aging's Men's Breakfast. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to this morning's speaker. He is our favorite historian, Gus Roosh from Bradford, Mass., former teacher um, and hardcore historian, who's going to speak this morning on the flood of 1936. And be aware, afterward, there's some great, great pictures to, to enjoy. Welcome. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I won't take too long, but I have plenty here. Um, I was two years old when the flood of 36 occurred. I lived in Lawrence, and when I was young, my father told me that I was partly responsible for the flood of 36 <laughs> because I threw too many rocks into the Merrimack River. <laughs> he kept telling me that. I never forgot it. And the reason I have this on is because Amesbury is celebrating their 350th anniversary this year. And since I'm curator of Whittier Birthplace, they asked me to come down to Amesbury and read some poems as the old Mr. Whittier. So they said, please grow some kind of a beard. I only have a few more weeks, but that's all right. Better than nothing. Your wife's going to be real happy. About My wife is always happy when I grow a beard. Yeah. Oh, she certainly is. She doesn't like to go out with her great-great-grandfather. <laughs> she hands me the raisin when the show is over. All right, the flood of 36. 1935-1936 winter was long, cold, and very stormy. Temperatures were much lower than normal. Northern New England had snowpacks with more than seven inches of water in them. On March 9th, a heavy rainstorm moved into New England and stalled. Temperatures increased quickly, and many areas were hammered with five inches or more of rainfall. This was just the beginning of New England's most disastrous flood. On March 12th, there were snowslides and mudslides on the eastern side of the presidential range in the White Mountains. This was a bad omen. Four days of warm weather and much rain had begun to take a toll on lakes, streams, and rivers. As nighttime approached on the 12th, highways and ordinary roads were getting destroyed <coughs> by rushing river water and huge blocks of ice. Even sections of some bridges washed away the pressure started to build. Smaller rivers like the Saco, the East Pemigewasset, the Sebastocook, and many other rivers were running wild. Lake Winnipesaukee and other lake Reed began to spill over <coughs> into the rivers. The rain and melting snow <coughs> continued for the next four days. Soon the larger rivers like the Antiscargan, the Kennebec, the Penobscot, the Pemigewasset, the Merrimack, and the Connecticut began to swell. Then there was a period of 24 hours when things seemed to quiet down, but it was just the calm before the storm. <coughs> then on March 18th and 19th, Pinkham Notch area received over 10 inches of rain. That's a lot of rain. And the large rivers, including the Merrimack, began to roar, raising havoc with ice flows and rushing water. The flooding <coughs> of many towns and cities took place. Most of these had never experienced such disastrous results. Beyond rushing water was taking over. In some cases, whole bridges were washed away with houses and other buildings. The few dams that were on the rivers in those days took a beating. Some were even destroyed. 
in Holyoke on the Connecticut River, a huge ice jam eventually sheared off a 1,000 feet wide, five feet high section of the granite dam. Holyoke was inundated. In Hooksett, New Hampshire, the downtown area eventually had over 18 feet of water. 18 feet, that's 10 more feet than, than Havel downtown. Just imagine Groveland or Havel with 18 feet of water. <coughs> new flow records and new high water marks were established all over the Northeast. In Haverhill, the Merrimack River reached 30 feet above normal, and the downtown had seven to eight feet of water. At one point, the Merrimack River rose five feet in 24 hours. All of the rivers were rising that quickly. Until forced to abandon the post office downtown in Haverhill, when the water inside was five feet deep, carriers had continued to deliver mail to businesses downtown using boats and ropes were used to pull the mail to the upper floor windows. <coughs> ropes were thrown down, up the mail went. The northeast region of the United States, from Maine to Virginia, was a disaster when the floodwaters receded at the end of the month. Mud and debris was everywhere. They had to bring in the National Guard, they had to hire all kinds of people just to get the mud out and all the debris. The Groveland Bridge was almost destroyed with all the debris against that. Even uh, the, the marina over in Bradford, that fell apart and came smashing down into the Groveland Bridge. There are pictures of those, too. <clears throat> the cleanup and rebuilding began and went on for a very long time. Property damage in New York and New England alone was estimated to be more than $100 million. And that's in 1936. <coughs> that was a lot of money. That figure went up to 300 million when all 13 states in the Northeast were included. This flood went all the way down to the Potomac and the James Rivers. They overflowed their banks. They had the worst floods they had ever had. So it wasn't just New England. It went all the way down to Virginia and Maryland. Over 400,000 people were homeless, and almost 200 people had lost their lives as a result of the flood of 1936. A prolonged period of rain, quickly rising temperatures, rapidly melting snowpacks in the mountains, and the large crushing ice packs <coughs> had caused the worst flooding this area had ever, ever seen. Shortly thereafter, Haverhill asked for and received over a million dollars from the federal government to build a seawall from the county bridge to the Bradford Bridge, now the Basilea Bridge. This wall helped save downtown Haverhill from flooding again when a damaging hurricane hit the area in 1938, two years later. Uh, and that was a terrible hurricane. Here's hoping we never see the likes of the 36 <coughs> flood again. But we have to remember, this is New England. As we found out this winter, anything can happen on any day. It may even snow today. Some places have predicted <coughs> to get a little snow. Uh, up here, there's a copy of the 1936 souvenir edition of the Boston Post newspaper loaded with pictures, and the map shows all kinds of dis disasters all the way down through New England. The book page shows a map of New England and lists some of the damage in the infamous flood of 36. Now, there's a funny part about this flood. 
downtown Haverhill had over eight feet of water. And the banks didn't get a lot of their bonds and their currency in the vaults quickly enough. And as the water rose, uh, the bills and the bonds were floating around inside. There are pictures in Haverhill magazine showing the money floating around. One of the bank presidents, uh, Mr. McGregor, he got a boat and he rode up Merrimack Street. The water inside was just as high as outside. He couldn't do anything with it for a while. But when the water receded, he went down there and he rounded up all of the currency <laughs> soaking wet, all of the bonds soaking wet, rounded it all up, and then brought it home and brought it to the attic. And they strung up ropes, clotheslines in the attic for the bonds and the bills hanging from it. That's how it all dried out, but it wasn't over. Mrs. McGregor had the job of ironing out all of the currency, <laughs> all of the currency and the bonds. And then they were all brought back to the Haverhill National Bank. Um, I used to tell this story when I teach the Haverhill history, I tell the story to the kids. And quite often they do drawings for me and I write notes. One little girl, she drew a beautiful picture of the bank on Merrimack Street, the high water inside, and it showed all the currency floating around. But she went a little bit too far. We also saw the half dollars and the quarters and the dimes and nickels and pennies. They were floating around too. <laughs> I never know what's going to happen. So. I, I have been collecting these pictures over the years. They're on both sides. Um, I have a lot more at home, but I didn't think I'd have enough room. Um, but um, you're welcome to look at these. I didn't want to talk so long today because pictures are worth, really worth more than a thousand words. Just to look at the pictures and see the damage it's much more important than me just speaking to you over and over. So I, I hope we never get another one of those floods. And I have stopped throwing rocks into the Merrimack. <laughs> In fact, I didn't even let my son throw rocks into Merrimack. Uh, we were lucky, my family, because we're from Lawrence, not from Havel or from Groveland. We lived on top of Prospect Hill in Lawrence, uh, up next to Engine 6 and the Rollins School. You see the clock when you go by at 495. We lived at the tippity top, so we never worried about any water up there. But downtown Lawrence, they got a hit by the water. And Lowell, Lowell was a disaster, too. They hit 46 feet above sea level up in Lowell, 46 feet above the level of the sea. Uh, now we have a lot better dams built after the storm, and I hope we never see another one like it. But, um, you're welcome to look at these before 9.30. Okay, thank you very much for coming today. I was 40 okay. years old and I remember watching a house floating down by our house in Ward Hill. In Ward Hill? Yeah. There's a great picture of a man sitting on top of a house and it's floating down the Merrimack. And there's a man in a rowboat going to rescue him. But the picture was taken by another man, a Boston Post reporter, photographer, sitting on another house floating <laughs> down the Merrimack River, taking the picture eye level. Yeah. Wow. And he's on another house. He got rescued too. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that picture. <laughs> yeah. We were so, lucky in water here. The house was just high enough. Yeah, I know it.
Thank you very much for coming. So you're welcome to look at any of you can open that. Okay.